welcome to another episode of Access Ability. It's a show on YouTube where I talk about the video game industry, accessibility, and representation. Basically, how can we help more people to play games and more people to see themselves in the games they play? Now, I don't talk about this hugely often, but as a child, I got diagnosed with a condition called dyspraxia, also known as developmental coordination disorder. What that means in practice is I have a lot of difficulty with spatial awareness, awareness of timing and coordination of my body. Um, I struggle with keeping a regular rhythm, sort of a just a standard beat. I struggle with knowing where I am in relation to things. I walk into a lot of doorways, I trip over a lot. I struggle with big sweeping movements, I can't kick a football very well. And I also struggle a lot with fine motor control, so I struggle with things like with writing, with putting together little model kits, anything where my fingers and my hands have to make small precise movements. I struggle to get my brain to tell my limbs what to do. Over the years, I've had a lot of practice at coordination. Um, when I was in school, I had to go for separate lessons to learn how to write because my writing was illegible. And day to day, other than walking into tables occasionally, I'm pretty okay. I've, I've learned to manage my condition, but I still sometimes have issues trying to play certain kinds of video games. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about dyspraxia. I'm going to talk about the difficulties it can cause for people playing games, and I'm going to talk about some of the games that potentially provide solutions that might help more people with my condition to play a wider variety of games more effectively. The primary things I tend to find difficult when gaming with dyspraxia is anything related to very precise timing, complex button inputs, and precision movement within game worlds. Let's start with precision timing. Games such as Guitar Hero or Rock Band are pretty much the epitome of games based around timing. Hitting buttons at the correct time is basically the entire point of those games. While Guitar Hero games do have a very precise moment they would like you to hit buttons, there's a little bit of leeway built in for poorly timed inputs, and difficulty options to help simplify the kinds of inputs needed. By playing on easy mode, many complex rhythm patterns are reduced down to more standard and simplified beats, with the song still progressing if you hit a few mediocre notes along the way. You might not get a high score if you don't hit things perfectly on time, and you can fail based on poor timing, but the game has degrees of success, and this is a model I would love to see adopted in games games as an accessibility option. Let's picture timing a parry in Dark Souls, for example, as being like trying to hit a note in Guitar Hero. Currently, only a perfect hit of the note will succeed, but what if you slightly increase the timing window so that an okay timed hit would still produce a parry? Basically, by increasing the timing before or after a prompt that you will accept as successful slightly, you allow players like myself with dyspraxia a better chance to engage with those mechanics. Instead, when I play Dark Souls, I exclusively dodge because that has a more forgiving window. I just don't engage with that mechanic because it requires a level of precision I physically can't do. This same theory can be applied to in-game elements such as quick time events, where increasing the time you have to hit a button, or just completely removing the timer, can help players who struggle with timings not hit a roadblock in your game. Games such as Marvel's Spider-Man on PS4 already have settings that remove timers from quick time events, and they're very, very helpful. Next, let's talk about complexity of button inputs. One of the main reasons that I play Super Smash Bros a lot more than basically any other fighting game series is the physical complexity of button inputs. I love fighting games as a genre, I find them fascinating. I play most new ones when they release, but being totally honest, a lot of days my hands simply can't do a shoryuken motion or a series of quarter circle inputs precisely and reliably. My hands are not great at doing what I tell them, and that often Often ends up causing me to fail inputs. The reason I love Smash Bros as a fighting game series is that all of the characters' inputs are mechanically simple and consistent across most characters. Regular attacks are the A button and a direction. Special attacks are the B button and a direction. Smash attacks are the right stick in a direction. You have a block and a dodge button, and that's basically all your inputs. In many cases, a character in Smash has just as many moves open to them as a character in a game like Street Fighter, in a one-on-one -on -one fight, but with a much more simplified set of ways to access those moves. This is a big part of why I find Smash a more accessible fighting game. Just look at Ryu in Smash. Sure, you can do his attacks in Smash using command inputs, but you can also just do regular Smash Bros inputs to do the same attacks with more ease. When Street Fighter 4 came to the 3DS early on in the 3DS's life, 
a lot of people mocked that port of the game because on the touchscreen on the bottom screen, you had the option to put special moves as just a single touchscreen tap. You didn't have to do a complicated button input, you could just press the button, you're gonna throw off a shuriken or whatever. And a lot of people mocked that because, oh, it's making the moves way too easy to pull off, there's no challenge. But I disagree, I really love that. I love that that was an option in the game because you didn't make them these, these attacks completely complacent to, to pull off. You still had to know, what's the safe timing? Can I do this attack without being punished? Have I got a good window to pull the attack off here? I just didn't have to make my thumbs do a complicated movement that I'm not reliably good at doing, no matter how much I practice it. I really love that because it made the execution accessible so I could focus on the strategy, and for me that was wonderful. A lot of people mock the idea of games having simplified controls, but honestly, in a lot of games I would sacrifice a little bit of functionality to be able to play the game without complex button sequences being a part of the equation. At the crossroads between timing and input complexity is precision movement within game worlds. If you look at a game like Celeste, all about climbing a dangerous mountain by making precise jumps through dangerous levels, I think you can see how the previous two issues intersect. As a player with dyspraxia, I found Celeste tough in places because I had to precisely time my jumps, move my stick precisely during those jumps, keep my character at the right position on screen, land those jumps, and in some cases instantly switch to a new jump in a new direction. How did Celeste tackle this issue? Well, in their accessibility menu, they gave players like myself the option to slow down the game speed incrementally, as well as give ourselves extra jumps or invincibility temporarily. I played most of Celeste at the developer intended difficulty, but being able to occasionally turn on invincibility, so I wouldn't fail if I drifted slightly too close to a wall of spikes, or slow down the game speed so that I had a slower and wider window to execute jumps correctly, made the whole game more manageable. I had more time to switch between inputs, more room to course correct mistakes, and a bit of a safety net if I went a little too far in a direction, you know, more than I meant to. Beyond that, in games that are focused on precision play, a little extra leeway goes a long way. Maybe have an option to extend the space at which you can jump off a platform or land on a platform by just a few pixels, just slight, maybe slightly magnetise the player. Make sure that if they almost stuck the landing, you just give them that little extra nudge. Sometimes that's all that's needed to make a game accessible. And lastly, and this is important. Offer players a setting that makes checkpoints really frequent as an option in your games, even if it's not your default. As a player with dyspraxia, I don't mind sometimes having to do a challenging series of jumps again and again and again until I get it right. The problem is, if I spend 10, 15, 20 minutes getting a platforming challenge done correctly, I finally complete it, and I die on the next jump, and have to redo that first section again, it's not going to be fun. If I'm lucky enough to manage a tough segment, I can't guarantee how long it's going to take me to replicate that. Let me move past the content I have managed to pass and try the next piece. Generally, my advice to developers who want to make their games more accessible to players with coordination difficulties like mine would be that you need to make sure that there are forgiving windows, uh, have options for making the windows for certain timings more accessible. Make uh, precision, make your window for what level of precision is required just a little bit more forgiving, and if you really want to push out the boat, give us a little extra time so that we can think a little more about those movements, that we're not having to instantly gut reaction get every precise movement with our hands correct at the instant it's asked for. A little bit of breathing room goes such a long way for allowing me to play more games. Most of the time, when I struggle to play a game, my brain knows exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. It's not a lack of awareness of what to do. My brain and my hands just don't communicate terribly well together, and sometimes a little bit of leeway, be that a little bit of room on timing, a little bit of room on precision, just a little bit of extra forgiveness, can help me to keep playing the games that I love. 